It is what it is, he said rather glibly. It is what it is. And I roared back, no it isn't. I had a friend um, from three parishes or so ago visit uh, not long ago. Uh, and we sat in my office and we exchanged, you know, pleasantries. We caught up. Uh, but then he changed the tone and kind of went into an almost confessional mode. He told me that uh, the family business um, that he had, that was part of um, had been almost destroyed through his selfishness and um, his, destructive, his destructive actions. Uh, then he went on to tell me that because of that he was terribly estranged from his brother uh, and I recalled always seeing them together like they were inseparable, but now they were strange, even though the company has rebounded uh, from his bad actions, his selfish actions, he is still estranged from his brother. Uh, and at the end of telling me that, he says, almost with a yawn, it is what it is. And I recoiled and said, no it isn't. During Lent, we need to combat the fatalism uh, that is rampant amongst us. We need to confront that malady. Because if it is what it is, Christ isn't. If it is what it is, Christ isn't. If it is what it is, you and I are stuck with our mistakes. If it is what it is, uh, we are moored in um, our, um, our uh, dark actions. If it is what it is, we can never escape our sinful thoughts. Um, if it is what it is, um, we're caught in a mad cycle, a mad cycle of destruction. But it isn't. Christ is. And the one who does yeoman's work for us in this um, is Nicodemus. You know, uh, he comes to see Jesus by night. This well-regarded this well teacher of the law um, has kind of checked. He's, he's checked all the boxes. Uh, he comes to see Jesus by night. Now, my whole life as a Christian, I have mainly advertised him coming at night because he was embarrassed. He didn't want anybody to see him. Well, now that I've gotten a little longer in the tooth, I think he comes to Jesus at night because he can't sleep. <laughs> I know the laughter is real because those of us about my age in my age group know uh, how hard it is, how hard it is uh, when, we, when we know we know we have, we, have, we have treated someone wrongly. When we know we have been kind of, uh, we're mired in, in darkness. When we know uh, we have really made some missteps, um, uh, it's hard to sleep at night. Uh, and so here's Nicodemus. Uh, he is not really happy with himself, and he goes to see Jesus. And because he's heard this itinerant rabbi may have some answers. So he, he knocks on the door, and Jesus answers, and Nicodemus starts off with all those pleasantries, kind of like my buddy who came to see me. He says, oh, Rabbi, we know that no one could, could do the signs that you're doing unless God was with him. At that time in the evening, Jesus has no time for chit-chat. He goes, Nick, I'm going to tell you the truth. Unless... Unless someone is, is born again, he will never see the kingdom of God. Not exactly what Nick was expecting out of the gate. The Greek here is very instructive and important for us uh, to understand. Um, unless someone is born again. The word again here in the Greek is anothen. And it has almost nothing to do with again. Uh, the word means born from above. Unless someone is born from above, you will never see the kingdom of God. 
which makes a lot more sense. Unless God discloses himself to you, unless God shares his will with you, you'll never see his kingdom. I mean, think about, um, think about the, um, the passage that uh, uh, Catherine easily read from, from Genesis. God discloses himself to Abraham. Abram, he has no doubt what God wants. <laughs> he has no doubt. God discloses his will to him. So unless God, unless God discloses himself to you, unless you're born from above, um, you'll, never, you'll never see the kingdom. You'll never see the kingdom. Um, to this, to this, I think Nicodemus doesn't, he doesn't respond uh, tritely. He says, how can a man be born when he is old? And again, I was studying the Greek, and the word for born here is geneo. It, obviously, it is, the, it is the foundation of our English word generative. How can a man, how can a man experience new life when he's, when he's old and stuck in his ways? How can a man have hope when he is caught up in homeostasis? How can a man be generative? How can he experience new life? Uh, when he's been doing the same thing for so long, something we know about. And Jesus' answer is, Nick, you must be born from above. You must be born from above. But how does that happen? How does God disclose himself to us? Well, Jesus tells Nicodemus in language that he can understand. Now, this is something I really like about Jesus. There's a lot of things I like about Jesus. Uh, some days I like him a little less because he calls me down on, on so much of my own life. But, but um, you know, when Jesus is speaking, he always knows his audience. So, you know, most of the Bible, in most of the Bible, Jesus is speaking to uh, agrarian people, mainly illiterate agrarian people. And he speaks to them using the images, symbols they know. You know, a farmer was sowing seeds. Uh, weeds grew up with the wheat. A man had, his crops were so, were, were, uh, were so great, he had tore down one barn and built bigger barns. You see, that's the stuff they would have known. But with Nicodemus, he chooses to talk about an obscure part of the Torah. He tells, he, he reminds him um, of, a, of a story in the Torah. It's, it's, it's a strange story, so get ready. It's from Numbers 21. Any of you that are having insomnia, you might try Numbers. It's a pretty good remedy. Uh, but Numbers 20, and so the, the, the scripture goes like this. Uh, Jesus says to Nicodemus, um, No one has ascended into heaven except the one who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. No one knows. No one knows the will of the Father except the one who has descended from the Father. That's me, says Jesus, right? That's me. I'm the one who discloses the will of the Father. I'm the one who reveals the Father, okay? And then he breaks off into, uh, uh, in, into an allusion to the strange story. And he says, just as Moses lifted up a snake in the wilderness, so, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that all who believe in him will have eternal life. There you go, all right? So what about this snake in the wilderness? Great story. It's a good story, isn't it, Carter? Yeah, yeah. All right, so here's how the story goes in Numbers 21. Israel, of course, has been wandering in the wilderness, but now they come upon an army and some kings that are about to annihilate them. I mean, it is just like you're watching a John Wayne movie, and, you know, the forces of evil are all around. And, and Israel cries out to the Lord, Lord, help us, help us. And sure enough, God comes through, and Israel defeats this army they shouldn't defeat. Well, they know, I mean, they hadn't even finished the victory parade. They hadn't even picked up the ticker tape off the sand till they still is, until Israel starts complaining about the menu. And they start, again, they start complaining about the soup du jour that the Lord is, is offering. And this really hits God in a very bad place. As uh, we would say in Alabama, uh, they get on uh, God's very last nerve, okay? And so... He, <laughs> So he sends a bunch of fiery serpents down to put an end to them. Now, I'm going to tell you, a snake is pretty bad, right? You know, snakes can be bad. But when you have one that's on fire, it's really bad. 
<laughs> so he sends these fiery serpents down, and they start biting the children of Israel, and they start just croaking left and right. And Moses, Moses goes, wait, wait, God, wait, wait, wait. He says, you, you went to all this trouble to deliver these people. I, this, is not a good, this is not a good end game. He says, you know, please, I'm asking you to, to, to deliver your people. And the Lord says, okay, okay, okay. Uh, and he says, I want you to make a model uh, of one of those snakes and put it on a pole and lift it up. And if they look at that, they'll be healed. Hence, we had the caduceus, the, the symbol for the, for the, the medical profession. Uh, that's part of the reason why they do that. You've always wondered, you go to see your doctor, you say, why does he have snakes on a pole? You know, and there you go. Um, but anyway, um, you didn't know that, did you, Dr. Anderson? You know? I, okay. Uh, but anyway, that's what, uh, that's what it's about. All right. Why am I caught in this cul-de-sac about those snakes? Um, so, and so Jesus says, just as the snake was lifted up in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Well, of course, the Son of Man is going to be lifted up on, on, on a pole. He's going to be lifted up at Calvary. So that all that believe in this revelation of God will have eternal life. Now, this is very, very important. This is very important. Jesus has said to Nicodemus, Unless you're born from above, unless God discloses himself to you, you cannot see the kingdom. Of, you can't see the kingdom of God. Okay? But now he's saying, hang around, Nick, because you're going to see God disclosed. You're going to see the revelation of God, and it's going to be it's going to be the Son of Man lifted up on a cross. And when you see that, you will know what God is up to. God is up to saving you. God is up to sacrificing for you. God is up to loving you immeasurably. That's what God is up to. And as I've told you repeatedly over the last decade, um, if someone asks you what God is like, you tell them about Jesus Christ because he reveals God. I mean, people are, you know, they're always coming up to you and saying, I don't believe in God, you know. Okay, well, tell me about the God you don't believe in. And when they tell you, you'll go, you'll go, well, I wouldn't believe in that God either. <laughs> But let me tell you about the one who gives himself for us. Let me tell you about, about the bottomless love of God that is demonstrated in Jesus Christ. That's the God I believe in. That's all Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. Okay? That's what he's saying to him. That I will reveal God in his will to you. It's just not going to be, you know, if Nick was expecting a ta-da moment, he's instead getting a Calvary moment. Right? That's what you get. Now, just a little, bit, a little bit more here. And he says, so that those who believe in him will have eternal life. Well, the word, of course, believe in the Greek, as I've told you incessantly, uh, is pistis. It, means, it, it really means to put your trust in. It doesn't, it's not about a head trip. It's about putting your trust in the one who was crucified for us. Now, there's a big difference between those two. I mean, Americans love head trip Christianity. We love to have kind of this... This Gnostic Christianity. Oh yes, I have said, I believe Jesus is my Lord and Savior. It's all up here in my head. Yeah? Or have you acted on that? I mean, is there any fruit to that? It's kind of silly. But I put my trust in the one who sacrificed himself. That's, so I believe. And eternal life here, uh, the word for eternal life here is Ionius. Ionius. It means to participate in the divine life. Participate in so see, this is also key. If, if we believe in the revelation of God, if we believe that he's been revealed in Jesus Christ, if we believe that the sacrifice of, of Christ makes up the distance, distance between me, between us and God, if we believe that, we will begin to participate in the divine life now. Now. Our life in Christ begins now. We begin to participate in God's designs, in, under his rule, in his new design, now. That's what it means to have eternal life. It is not pushing the up elevator. It is now. And let me tell you how important it is. Okay, let me just tell you just briefly how important this is. 
It is what it is has a corollary. And that's, that's just the way it is. It is what it is has a corollary. That's just the way it is. And when we fall into that, we start saying, you know, the fact that some people don't have enough to eat, ah, that's just the way it is. The fact that some people have neighborhoods that don't have, that, that aren't safe, whose who septic systems and so forth, that's just the way it is. The fact that some people are separated out because they have a different skin color or they have a different, uh, different origin, uh, that's just the way it is. Or the fact that one big mighty country can descend on a smaller country and, and try to destroy it, and we say that's just the way it is. No, that's not just the way it is. Not in God's kingdom. Amen. It's true. It's not the way it is. Because if that's true, Christ isn't. If that's true, Christ isn't. And Christ is. Christ is. And while we have breath on this side of paradise, we're meant to participate in God's saving rule. Not be bystanders, but be participants. We can either do that, we can make our bed with the snakes.